you have your Bibles, I ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 27. If you don't have one, reach in front of you, and in the pew, there's a Bible. And I'm going to just ask you to follow along as we look at some of these verses. The title of this is, What Shall I Do With Jesus? And as we look at these verses and we think about that concept, many times we look at the story of what took place with Christ, and we look at it as a history story. We look at it and say, these are things I would have never done if I was in that position. We look at it and we say, I just wonder if. Many times we know people that are skeptic, maybe even full-fledged atheists, that say, I don't believe this, I don't want to have nothing to do with this. And what we miss is at this time when this circumstances were was happening to Jesus those were the people in whom did this but there was a question that continued to rise and it rise today when you talk about this with other people that question that about Jesus Christ and one of the questions is what do we do with that person they call Jesus what do we do when we get to that part that this story, this situation, separates it from any other religion? And one of the questions that is asked in this passage that we're going to look at this morning is, what do I do with Jesus? The first thing I want you to notice in Matthew 27, we're going to start there in verse 19. Right here in verse 19, it says, Beside... While he was sitting on the judgment seat with his wife, sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now, I want you to catch this, and many times we overlook this verse. It says, beside, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, this man was in a position that he could judge and that the results could have been whatever he said he wanted it to be. But his wife sent word to him and said, look, you don't want to have nothing to do with this. You don't want to pass judgment in which the crowd, which the people are wanting you to pass. She says, because my spirit is not right with this. And I want you to catch this. Some of the closest people to us is our spouses. Some of the closest people to us are those who love us the most, those in whom care about us the most. And in this circumstance, it was his wife. Many people, this judge, he had naysayers all around him that said and did the things that he wanted to do, or they had a hidden agenda, and they wanted him to do whatever it was their hidden agenda was to do. But his wife loved him. His wife cared about him. And she knew that the circumstances, the situation that they were in wasn't good. You say, well, what does that have to do with me? Do you realize that when we get out of step with God, we need to pay attention to those who are around us that are speaking into our ear and saying, look, you're messing up. You're out of step. But how many times in life do we blow those people off and we go ahead and make the decisions and the judgment that this man made? You say, well, I, I didn't crucify Jesus. I, I didn't send him to a cross. Well, think about it. When we choose to go ahead and sin and live life like we want to, that's the same thing. We are belittling his name. We are belittling his example. And we are not setting the example in which he desires for you or me to set. Check out the next verse. Verse 20. It says, now the chief priest. Now remember, he had just heard word from his wife. He should have had nothing to do with this. And the, now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barnabas and destroy Jesus. You see, the crowd started talking. 
We listen to the crowd more than we listen to those in whom are trying to direct us in the right way. Because guess what? If we listen to those in whom are trying to direct us in the right way, we have to admit fault. We have to admit wrong. And it's much easier to go with the flow of the crowd than it is to stand up and do what that is right. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew the accusations were false. He knew that. And it says here in this verse, it says the chief priest and the elders, they didn't go persuade the judge. They did it in a fear in his thinking at this moment because they realized that his wife had already sent word to him. He understood, they understood that that he knew what was right. Because he was wrestling with it. And then he got word from that in whom loved him, that in whom cared about him, that in which was trying to direct him in the right way. He was leaning that way. So the chief priest and the elders, they said, we can't get his ear right now. So let's go stir up the crowd. And let's give him a choice. He has to give us Barnabas instead of, and then he'll send Jesus to the cross. And so now, all of a sudden, the crowd, the people around him are trying to influence his choice, his decision. And in verse 21, it says, The governor again said to them, Which two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barnabas. Do you realize in that statement, he did not make the choice of which he knew was right. But he said to the crowd, Who do you want? He didn't follow the law. He didn't follow that in which he knew that he should follow. He did not follow the example and the vice in whom he was getting, that in whom was close to him, that in whom loved him. And he chose to listen to the world. He chose to follow that in which the world wanted him to do. You see, he said, okay, y'all have thrown a choice to me, Jesus or Barnabas. And he says, I'm not going to make the choice. I'm not going to stand up for that which is right. I'm just going to flow with the flow. I'm going to go with the crowd. I'm going to do that which is easy because I don't want to admit fault. I don't want to face my choice and the persecution that may come with my choice. So he gives the choice to the crowd. Do you realize that this man was a a political figure? That in whom had been elected to make this choice and this decision? Not the crowd, not the world, but this man. And he chose to listen to someone instead of that in which he was called to do. You say, well, what does that have to do with me? Check out this. You and I. We're created for God. We were created to live a life in which that example which he set for you and me. We are chose to forgive. We are chose to, to love others because Jesus has commanded us to do that. Amen. When we can't forgive other people, when we can't love other people, you cannot use the word, I am in step with God. You can't use the word, me and God are okay. When you have bitter, you have anger, you have rage in your heart, you cannot say that you are in step with God. That is a flat-out lie from the pits of hell. And here it is that this man knew he wasn't in step with God. He knew that he wasn't doing that which he was supposed to do. And now he is willing to compromise. How many times do we compromise that which we know we should be doing, but we choose to do what we want to do. Verse 22, it says, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? He says, Well, what should I do with Jesus? Do you realize that you and I every day are faced with that question the same way as he was? When we get up in the morning, What shall we do with Jesus today? Should we live for him or should we live for ourselves? 
What shall I do with him? What shall I do when I'm tempted? What shall I do when I speak? What shall I do when I have an action and a behavior? And it says there at the end of verse 22, they all said, let him be crucified. You see, he was asking the wrong people and to whom, what should he do with Christ? Many times our ears are tuned to the world. It's tuned to the crowd. Our ears are tuned to that in which the Lord is trying to tell us not to tune our ears to. He is telling you and me that we should tune our ears to that of Him and follow that example. Too many times we use our judgment and our measuring stick of life next to religion and theology. When that needs to go out the door and out the window, our measure stick and our desire and our direction for life should be that of God and God alone. And what his word tells us to do. And as we continue to look at this, the crowd said, crucify him. Kill him. Don't allow him to live any longer. Do you realize when we don't set the example and we don't live for Christ, we're allowing him to no longer live. You see, he arose out of this grave in three days, as he said. Then when he ascended into heaven, he said, you shall live for me. We should live in such a way as he lives at this very moment. But when we make the choices to not live for Christ, we're just nailing him to the cross and killing him. Check out the next verse, verse 23. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. See, this is showing you and me. He knew he was wrong. He's like, what wrong has he done? And they're saying, kill him. Don't let him live. Let's get rid of him. Let's do away with him. How many times do you think that's the way the world is trying to influence the Christian community? Do away with him. Quit speaking his name. Quit living for him. Live more like the world. Crucify him. Don't mention his name. Don't set the example for him. And many times, the Christians listen to the world instead of God and his word. Check out the next part. It says, let him be crucified. The part that you and I have to understand is there comes a time in our lives how we are faced to make a personal investigation into the life of Jesus Christ. We have to investigate for ourselves to that which he did on that cross, that in which he did in that grave, that in which he did through his life. Are we going to walk by faith and trust that? Or are we going to walk by worldly knowledge, worldly influence, worldly direction, and crucify him and not allow him to live for us? They shouted all the more, crucify him. Let's lead him to his own personal crisis and expression. Despite the question, what shall I do with Christ? The answer he received from the crowd was no help. Do you realize that when we allow the world, the temptations of the world, and we're looking for the world, we're looking for that other direction to help us live for Christ. The world gives us no help. It gives us no direction. The world just tells us to crucify him. I can't live your life. You can't live mine. But the question this morning, do you believe that he lives? If your answer is yes, then how are you doing with that? How are you doing with reflecting 
that in which he lives inside of you, that you're reflecting that in which he lives out there. How are you doing with that forgiveness? How are you doing with that love? How are you doing with that union between brothers and sisters in Christ? How are you doing with that union inside the home? How are you doing with that in which God has called you and me to do? When we're failing, we're not showing an example that he lives. And when we don't set the example in which he lives, how can the world believe that he lives? Let's pray. Father.